morning, everybody. Uh, we'd like to get started. It's about 9.35 and we have a full uh, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, before we begin, um, please take note of the exits. If you need to leave early, please do so quietly. There are exits in the back. Uh, my name is Farah Habib, and I'm Associate Professor of English. I'm the coordinator for this colloquium. Um, uh, the colloquium is titled, um, a more, Bristol Stands Against Hate, uh, A More Perfect Union. Uh, excuse me, I think it's the other way around. A More Perfect Union, Bristol Stands Against Hate. Um, so uh, this event, Other People, is the second installation in the colloquium series that I just uh, told you about, the title. Um, and I want to make a quick uh, plug-in for our next event, which will take place in November. Um, the topic is internet and self-radicalization, so another really timely and important topic. Uh, we'll be posting announcements about it um, um, you know, later on uh, in the next couple of weeks. And we also have several events planned for the spring. So this is an ongoing series up, un uh, up until May. Um, the idea of the series came about in the aftermath of the attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand last spring. Uh, we realized the hatred that fueled those attacks is no different than that which led to attacks um, on the Jewish community in Pittsburgh last year. Uh, the shootings in Parkland, El Paso, Ohio, and close to home here in Fall River when the Jewish cemetery uh, uh, was vandalized. Um, so through this colloquium, we seek to invite the Bristol community to reflect and act on ways to be more aware of what it means to be a part of a diverse world. Most importantly, we hope that these events will inspire people to get along and be willing to speak out when injustice and hatred are served around them. Um, and uh, I hope that you really uh, are able to take away something from this event and other events that we're, we're sponsoring. Um, a quick note before I invite uh, our Dean Kleiberg to introduce our speaker. Uh, you hopefully have received the evaluation forms. If you can take uh, a minute or two at the end of the presentation to complete those forms and hand them back to us, there'll be uh, somebody standing at the entrance to collect them from you. Uh, we would appreciate that. Um, so now I'd like to invite Dean Sarah Kleiberg, Dean of Humanities, to come and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Farah, and uh, thank you to Farah and all her colleagues for all the hard work that they're doing to put on this colloquium this year. Thank you for being here today as well. It is my honor to introduce Aisha Sultan, who is a nationally syndicated columnist, speaker, and independent filmmaker. She has hosted a weekly radio podcast and appears regularly as a TV commentator. Her work has run in more than 100 publications, including The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post, and she has won several national awards for her work. She lives with her husband, teenage children, and puppy in St. Louis, Missouri. So please join me in welcoming Aisha Sultan to Bristol. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for inviting me and having me here to share the very first short film I've ever made. Um, I'm really excited to hear your responses and your feedback to this piece of art that I've created. So we will watch it and then we'll I'm so glad you guys were finally able to see that. <laughs> Um, so, like Tarek, I've found myself in a few awkward situations before. The most recent time, I was in a hair salon getting my hair blown out, and the hairstylist says to me, just a normal question, so, where are you from? And uh, I told her. I said, I grew up in Texas, but I've lived here for about 20 years now. And then I could tell from the expression on her face that's not quite the answer she was looking for. What she was really wondering is, why are you brown? And so she persisted. And so the follow-up question was, but where's your family from? And I knew where she was headed, so I gave her the answer she was looking for. I said, uh, my parents immigrated from Pakistan. And then I had a question for her. 
so where are you from? And she kind of laughed, like a little surprised by the question. And she said, oh, I'm just a regular American. A regular American. So then I had a follow-up question. But where is your family from? And she kind of stumbled around for an answer because she's clearly not used to being asked this question. Nobody asked white people the follow-up question. I mean, unless it's St. Patrick's Day and everyone's pretending to be Irish. <laughs> <laughs> but I get this question a lot. It starts with the where are you from translates and transitions into where is your family from? Where are you originally from? What's your ethnicity? What's your background? What's your heritage? And most of the time, those questions are asked with no bad intent. It's simple curiosity. But the underlying implication of those questions, those follow-up questions, is always the same. You're not from here. You're not one of us. You're not a regular American. So I would estimate that since grade school, I've had a conversation like this about 2,000 times with people. Uh, it just comes up a lot when you're in rooms in which you look different than other people. And people might have assumptions about you. And that's sort of part of daily life of navigating a country where you're a minority in spaces that are dominated predominantly by the majority. Um, I think that even though I was born in Chicago, raised in Houston, and raising my kids in St. Louis, it's something that I've had to contend with in my day-to-day -day life and learning how to function in society. Now, I want each of you guys to take a minute and think back to a situation in which someone might have made you feel like you didn't quite fit in in a situation, OK? Maybe um, it was in school when a group of kids didn't think you were cool enough to hang out with them. Maybe you were at an event where everyone was much older than you, or at a party where everyone's much younger than you. Maybe you were at a meeting where everyone was of another gender. Or maybe you were at a job where you never quite felt fully accepted or appreciated. So you're there in that moment. So now imagine that place is your own country. That place is where you consider home. And that's also the place where some people will continuously or repeatedly make you feel like you don't quite fit in, whether it's just simple curiosity, or it could be outright hostility. Humans are wired with the need to belong. It's an intrinsic motivation to feel that we're socially accepted and connected with others. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, belongingness is right in the center, right next to love. It is a prime motivator of human behavior. Since the last presidential election, it's been harder for some Americans to feel like we fit in, that we're truly accepted. I mean, aren't we regular Americans too? We live in a country that's supposedly bound by common ideals and values, but they can be harder to see these days. They can be harder to see and feel when you see people cheering the message, go back to where you came from. That phrase takes me right back to high school. My mom is driving to pick me up and take me to the next activity after school. And my mom wears a hijab. She wears a scarf to cover her hair. And in our small, close-knit, suburban Texas town, we're just driving along the street, and a man leans out of a pickup truck. And he screams as we're driving by, go back to Iraq. It was during the first Iraq war. 
Obviously, we're not from Iraq. My mom and I both pretended not to hear. She kept driving. Lately, that phrase has come up more frequently in the anonymous mail that I get from readers who might be angry about something I've written in my column, an opinion that I've expressed. Recently, I opened a handwritten letter that was addressed to me, sent to the newsroom. And people still send snail mail. <laughs> it's amazing. I could, probably because most like physical newspaper readers are a little bit older than you guys. And so this person had written a note that said, go back to Pakistan, you towel-headed, raghead, commie bigot. Who gets to be a regular American? I think that we can start to make a difference in smaller, personal ways. If we talk honestly about where do our assumptions come from and how do we counteract them? Because some level of bias is part of being human. It's part of absorbing all those messages growing up in our homes, from our families, from society. And we use all that subconscious programming to make instant decisions, hundreds of split-second decisions that we make without even thinking about it. I think what we don't realize is that when you're repeatedly on the receiving end of other people's assumptions, there are social, emotional, economic, and even health impacts. When you receive the same subtle message thousands of times, it can begin to erode your own sense of belonging. The questions that we choose to ask one another have the potential to either bring us together or alienate us. And when our questions or our actions come from a place of unexamined assumptions, what they end up doing is alienating us, disconnecting us, and making us more suspicious of one another. I think most of us will find ourselves in this kind of interaction at some point. So what if you're the one facing those questions? How and when should you challenge someone's assumptions? I mean, what if it's a friend or a coworker or a stranger? And what if you're the one being challenged? How do you respond? Do you get defensive and dismiss what you're hearing because it feels like an attack on your character? or your intentions that you didn't mean? Or do we embrace this as a moment of humility, of understanding, of growth? I have a question for everyone in this room. Do you think that we can all do better? I think, I think so. And this place right now, for the next half hour, is going to be a place to safely explore these questions some of your classmates and colleagues have graciously agreed to be on a panel to talk about the film and their own experiences, so I'd love to invite them to join me so we can begin. Thank you. Come on up, guys. Just pull these chairs up a little closer. Yeah. There we go. Just kind of keep them aligned. There we go. Okay, first I'm going to ask everyone just to say your name and introduce yourself for the audience. We'll start here. I'm Anita Guerrero and I'm a full-time student. You can, and just pass the mic, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, can you repeat your introduction? Uh, my name is Anita Guerrero and I'm a full-time student here at BCC. Hi everybody, I'm Erin Smith. I am the coordinator of our civic engagement program here at the college. Hi, my name is Gray Lenor, and I'm a full student uh, for accounting, and I'm from Dominican Republic. Hi, um, sorry about my voice, by the way. Um, I'm Alexis. I'm a student and tutor here at uh, BCC. Hi, my name is Nishan Almeida. I am a student, a communication student here at the BCC. Perfect. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to ask you guys, 
if there was any character or scene that resonated with you and what you saw and why. Oh yeah, definitely the dad. I feel like he was brave like for going to the party because um, I get the questions that he got all the time and I feel like um, most of the time I do feel uncomfortable, but I'm also brave. I usually like have an answer that gets like the people um, wondering. For example, like I always get that question, um, what are you? Because I look different and I have an accent. So I usually say, I'm an American. I'm an American citizen. And they, they say, uh, yeah, but where are you from? And I'm like, I'm Cape Verdean. I'm from Africa. And then when I say I'm from Africa, they look me up and down and they say, really, but you don't look African. And I'm like, what do Africans look like? We're so diverse. You know, so to me, I connected more with the dad, okay. definitely. Um, so I, I connected with that, that family moment as well. I don't remember what the, the wife's name Amy. was. Amy. So, um, so my personal experience with othering is more around sexuality. However, um, my partner is, um, is Kamai, and um, so we are a same-sex interracial family. Um, and so when it comes to sort of the, the theme of, of this film, um, I have been on Amy's side a lot more than I ever expected. Um, and so that comes from the experiencing the commentary around the where are you from, not directed at me, but very brazen in, in just about any setting, um, to my kids being asked, what are you? Um, and then uh, my oldest is in middle school now, and so we're experiencing a lot of the ramifications of this dialogue that's sort of trickling down into the middle schools where my oldest has come home on more than one occasion to talk about sort of racially charged things that have been said to him. Most recently, a kid told him to go back to China, and he's, he's not Chinese, but either way, that's not appropriate. So trying to navigate that from a, a personal yet peripheral sort of experience is, is interesting, um, not necessarily in a good way, though. Yeah. Um, well, uh, okay. In my personal experience, uh, I'm from Dominican Republic. My English is not perfect, so I have an accent. And when when you look me, I don't look that Dominican. But when I speak, the people found that I have accent. So sometimes it's very difficult for me because um, the people sometimes less that you are not intelligent. And I can express that... I feel because sometimes I don't have the exactly words in English because I am learn and learning English and it's a lot of process. But um, I try to do my my best and I'm here for learning English. So thank you. The conversation Tark and Amy had about going to the party is more me and my mom on several occasions where she would not want to put me into situations like this where my race, my personality would even clash, but I would be the one trying to play peacemaker and tell her, even if they think that, that's not who I am, and if I can show them, maybe they can, I can change their minds, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I, sorry. Um, I like that moment with the little girl, like the little, like, this um, back and forth she had with the little girls and the whole thing about like not being a real princess. And I feel like a lot of people didn't experience that where like if you're not like the whatever the, the main majority or dominant thing of a, yeah. the predominant race or wh whichever identity you choose to be, I think that might even seep deep into your like like identity where like you think like, oh I can't succeed in this world or like the the and I feel like it's all part of it where it's, it goes deeper than just like being like personally, um, like, I guess, I forget the word, but, but it just goes deeper into yourself and like express it and like how to like succeed. So it, it affects people deeper than like just like on the outside level. Well, and I think probably every single person in this room has had a moment where they have felt awkward or not welcome or not, in, regardless of your race, your gender, your ethnic backgrounds, your social class, like you've had a moment where you've experienced that. The difference is, is how often and to what degree you experience it. Is it a part of daily life or weekly life? Or is it 
just something so rare that it stands out in your mind, right? Um, I'd like to add something like to what she said. She said that because he, uh, she has a strong accent, people usually think that she's dumb. And that's something that is very common. Like for immigrants, like when we struggle to learn English and when we finally do, we end up with an accent. People think that we're not smart because you know, the way we talk, but that's not true. Like the, it's so different. If you really think about it, just trying to learn a second language means you're really smart. Even yeah. if, I mean, yeah. have you guys ever tried? Yeah. Yeah. Like, It's very tough, especially, and uh, in my case, I speak four languages, and I used to be like so embarrassed for my accent in English, but now I'm kind of like embracing it, and I'm proud, I'm proud that I have an accent. It means that I also speak another language, and um, this kind of motivates me, like the fact that she said people look at us like as being dumb, this motivates me like to um, be an advocate for people struggling to learn a new language mm -hmm. as well as adapting to a new culture because it's it's tough like you you might not you might not think that uh, it doesn't happen but it does it happens and it's very common like we go through it all the time well you raise an interesting point because when I showed this film um, when you know with not as many technical difficulties <laughs> to some of my friends in St. Louis they were like, Oh, you've only experienced that because you live in that like conservative Midwest state, like in the you know flyover country, and you, like you need to move to the city. <laughs> and part of me thought, well, I've lived in plenty of places and I've been in plenty of places of America. So I wanted to ask you guys, like, you live in um, a more diverse community, in a liberal part of the country, um, with a show of hands. Would you say that the stuff that you saw in the film was something you've encountered in real life frequently? Just like, yeah, okay. Um, can you speak a little bit about whether there are some mis um, misconceptions about the fact that, well, that kind of thing doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen in our community. It doesn't happen at, I mean, look, look at the room. It does. So diverse. It does. Trust me, it does. I remember. Um, can you speak in the mic? Yes. When I was taking ESL classes to learn English, um, I was also taking a math class with regular American students. Um, I remember uh, the professor had mentioned that I got the highest grade on the midterm. And the girl sitting next to me, she turned to me, she was like, um, Oh, how is that possible that you got the highest grade when you don't even speak English? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, like, I got a little upset, but at the same time, I turned to her and I calmly explained to her that just because I do my math in another language doesn't mean it's going to be different. It's still the same. Math is universal. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Can any of you guys, does anybody else have an experience like that to show? Um, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to make a movie with my friends, and our friendship was kind of weird to begin with. We would always make jokes about each other, just try to bring each other down, just all in good fun, but they would always do it just the constant bit more to me, whether they knew I was listening or not. So when it came time to make the movie, I wanted to get all the friends that I've ever had involved because I would need as much help as possible. They didn't exactly like that idea. Instead, it was more of an us versus them situation, and I had to bring to their attention every friend that they have, I don't have a problem with, but it's the fact that it's me and the fact that I would always go along with everything that they said. They kind of made me feel like the black sheep of the situation, and rightfully so, because I'm the only ethnic friend that they have, and it's mm -hmm. most likely so they can get the points for it. Mm -hmm. um, can, do you mind talking a little bit about what did Lindsay mean when she said, oh, I'm sorry about that thing that was said at the park, but you're not like those other people. Can, can you speak a little bit to that, please? Um, sure. What, what do you think she meant there? Well, I think there's a, I think that there's a, um, 
a set of assumptions that could be derived from personal experience, media driven, et cetera, um, that would lend oneself to um, make an assumption about a general populace, right? So the, the other meaning like, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that maybe she was making an assumption about his religion, right? Um, and then therefore assuming the acts that come from a particular region. I can say, speaking to that on a personal level, uh, my freshman year of college was um, September of 2001. Um, and so uh, I had to experience both the particular day of 9-11, but the aftermath of that, which I grew up in Attleboro, um, and so the the transition to New York City was pretty hard in general. Um, but the that one day, people will talk about this one day where everybody came together and supported each other, but that that's not exactly accurate um, because the post 9/11 world, even in New York City, so kind of going off of your point of like, oh, it's just that like kind of rural area, you should move to the city. Um, I had two professors who um, may have looked Muslim, right? But one professor was Sikh um, and the other was not affiliated. Um, one of my favorite professors who identified as Sikh, um, he was jumped at a bar and he was beaten because of the assumption that he was Muslim. And he came into class the next day with all of the, the markings. And it was just sort of this very real tangible moment of somebody looked at him and made this assumption about him. Um, and so I, I thought always, find it interesting, again, not in a good way, when people look at somebody and make these assumptions. And then to kind of backtrack off of the, the of, oh, well, you're not like those others. Well, I have no problem with you. I have problems with people who look like you, who I assume do bad things, right? Right, so sometimes um, when you're a minority, you carry the burden of every action that everyone who looks like you, believes like you, uh, does. And so then once a person decides you're cool, then they create a separate place for you in their head. Like, okay, I still think what I think about every other Muslim or every other black person or every other gay person, but you're different. You're not like them, right? I think that also adds to the fact that they're relating to you, so they don't want to be related to something. So in their head, it's like a form of mechanism to like excuse the fact that like I'm relating to you, so I'm not relating to that section of it. Since you're in my life, I can't be that, so you can't be that. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, compartmentalizing. Um, let's talk about the reactions that the people in the films had to the sort of things that were being awkward, things that were being said, strange things that were being said. We saw Amy, when Lindsay, the party host, was talking to her, when she first made that statement of, oh, God, she must be hot in that. And then the next thing where she was like, her husband probably makes it makes her wear it. She's like, "What? What are you talking about?" You know, she's getting kind of confused. And then, when she says the thing that's like pretty much outright racist, like they're kind of everywhere, she's like, "I need to get away from this situation. I don't want to deal with this person." Have you guys been in situations when your impulse is to react like that, or what's another reaction that you've had? Anybody feel free to. Um, well, so I can, so again, kind of relating from the from the Amy perspective, um, I'm not, so I think that there was a, a passive nature to her confrontation, and then sort of the aftermath was, I'm just going to avoid this. Um, I can think of a very ex, uh, recent experience, actually, a couple years ago in camping, and my in-laws are all, are all Kamai, and I'm there with them, and we're at the campground, just got there, it's not quiet hours, and then the, um, the I don't know, the manager, I don't know, the patrol guy, I don't know idea what his title was, but Ranger, I don't know, came by and, um, and was very, and I was kind of in the back, and was very confrontational with my in-laws and my partner. You guys need to be quiet, what's wrong with you? You're a bunch of animals, you need to be cleaning up. The, and it's, well, not even quiet hours, but two had just gotten there, so really not a whole lot to clean up. Um, and so I felt like that was incredibly wrong, and I made assumptions about his reasoning behind doing that. So then I came up, and I, you know, and I said, well, we just got here, we just arrived. Um, you know, I, I believe quiet hours start in about 30 minutes or so, I promise we'll be settled down. And his demeanor with me was very different in that moment. But my choice was to then call that out. So I didn't want to just let that be. Um, 
and it was actually my in-laws, my partner was like, just let it be, just let it be. Um, but I am not somebody that tends to bite my tongue. So I tend to be the one that's more outspoken and confrontational because that's not necessarily my lived experience where I've been needing to live to appease a situation to not have confrontational moments every day. Right. Can anyone else on the panel talk about <coughs> whether the desire to just smooth things over is something that you've experienced or ignore or just let it go? Um, I think that, that um, the fact that she avoided her and then she was very upset after, which it was interesting, the fact that she didn't confront her friend or like this person in her life. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about that in terms of like, because like, I've been in that situation where like, this was like, like when I emigrated here, I lived in like New Jersey and and then after I moved here, so it's like I feel like when you like isolate yourself or just like move to a different situation, you like develop new pathways, and it's like you go back like. And I feel like I relate to like a lot of what I was talking about in terms of like going back to those old friends of like and like evaluating their behavior in terms of like how you've developed yourself, and you don't you want to savor that like sentiment of like, hey, this is my friends, even though they might have certain like like sentiments and like the way they express themselves and like they're not challenging themselves because they're still existing in that same bubble. Right. So it's interesting to see that like that she didn't like confront her friend, but she was visibly upset after it. Like it's Right. I don't know what that speaks about, like the culture. Well, we I, I think part of human nature is like you said, if you have a friendship or you're trying to make a friendship or it's someone who has more power than you in some way, whether it's a professor, a police officer, someone of authority, or even someone who's more popular than you or wealthier than you. Um, it's, it's difficult to figure out the right way to say something where you don't alienate yourself or get on their bad side because you don't want to be the target of like anything you know, that they vitriol that might come your way. And also, there is a desire to want to hold on to a relationship that was there, right? Um, but then the question becomes, is where, are we conscious about where we draw the line? <laughs> Have we thought about when are we going to speak up? In which moments is this going too far? And how am I going to say something to let it be known that I don't really agree with what's happening here? And most of the time, we're kind of shocked when it happens because we don't expect it or you're just like, daily life and something comes out of someone's mouth and you're sort of like, you know? Um, but so that's something to sort of preemptively think about is that do I know where my boundaries are with people, with my friends, my family? Do I know how I might respond in a way that's maybe not confrontational but lets people know how I feel? Uh, I wanted to ask you guys a little bit about how, if you've ever had a situation in which you've regretted or thought later, I wish I'd said that or I wish I'd handled that differently. Can you speak to that? So another high school story. <laughs> Back in graduation, my senior year, I was on the yearbook committees because I wanted to do better what we've done before because the past yearbooks weren't exactly the best. So. One of my friends at the time, she wanted to have a religious text, and I was a little iffy about it because re religion just in our school is a problem that we don't really talk about. It's usually the basic thing. You don't talk about religion, money, or politics. So I wanted to keep everybody like on neutral ground. So. I told her she might want to consider a different one just in case this might be taken the wrong way. And her mother came in to talk to the principal about it. And her response was, if you don't let my daughter do this, then the whole school will be on the media for discrimination. And I was like, OK, I understand because my mom goes mama bear and it's not a good situation. <laughs> on more than one occasion, if you yell at me or my brother, she will kick down a door just to get to you. So I'm like, OK, I understand. Yeah, that's fair. But my principal, 
her response to that was kick me out of the yearbook committee because I started the problem. Oh, wow. So it, all of my schooling was basically I'm the example. So that's why I squirreled myself away, kept to myself, and tried not to get in anybody's way. But I honestly wish I would have told her off because I've been putting up with that for too long. Mm. I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. Um, and so we can pass the mic or we can, if anybody has a question either about the film for the panelists, my background. Oh, question right here, yes. We're, we're bringing, we're bringing a mic to you, sorry. I understand where you're coming from with the language barrier. I am Puerto Rican, not full-blooded. My mom is from St. Kitts, my dad is from Anguilla, so I'm mixed race. And I understand where she's coming from. Back in Puerto Rico, we have a lot of racism. If you're not full-blooded, you don't belong there. But I'm, I was born there, and high school was real tough because you're ugly, mm. you look like a monkey. I understand where it comes from, but I took that and I embraced it. I was like, you don't like me? That's your damn business. Sorry for the language. That's your damn business. Mm. I'm a beautiful black queen, and trust and believe, baby. It hit hard home because Puerto Rican is three races in one, baby. We're black, we're Indian, and we're Spanish. Yes, yes. So I don't know where this, you're not, you're not belong here, you're not this, you're not that, you're not um, American. We've been in the anarchy, what, over a few decades now? And I hate to see, no, no disrespect, white people saying that you don't, you're not American because of what? You cut my brain, we see the same blood come out of me. Mm. So um, my point is, just embrace your, yourself, baby girl. Embrace it. <laughs> Thank you. We have, we have some questions over here, yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It was beautiful. Okay. Hello, so my name is Maggie, and um, I am also a student here at BCC. I am Puerto Rican. Uh, on behalf of a Puerto Rican, I want to say sorry that you had that experience with um, people from Puerto Rico. Um, that's truly awful. Um, to you guys, I would say, I share this um, story with someone in my history class. She's a lovely girl, I love her, um, but she, she, ha you know, she wants to do great in school, she wants to graduate, she wants to be a teacher, and she's doing amazing. And I share with her that I'm actually in the English Honors Program along with Deshaun and these lovely folks here, and she was completely shocked because I am from Puerto Rico, English is not my first language, you know, Spanish is. And she was shocked and she was like, what do you mean you're in the English honors program? I don't understand. And I'm like, well, because I don't know. I just, I believe I'm, I'm a very intelligent person and I'm gonna push myself no matter what. And I've always done really good in school. So I want to, if there's anybody else who English is not their native language. I want to encourage you guys to just push those barriers and not let anyone think that you're any less than what you know you are and just push. You guys are all intelligent. You guys got this and I applaud you guys for being here and being part of the panel discussion. Thank you. Woo! Hi, my name is Sheila and I'm from Massachusetts. But um, I think that being judgmental goes further than just, 
than just your race. I think that a lot of times people are very judgmental about whether or not you come from a dysfunctional family, um, if you're rich or poor, if you're thin or you're chubby, such as myself. <laughs> um, I dealt with this forever. And I actually have, I can tell you a story that my husband is very large and we had gone on a trip and we were walking in the Lincoln Plaza in Washington, D.C. And there were these two young gentlemen. And they were making fun of my husband. But I was in back of my husband. So I looked at them while my husband kept walking. And I said, how do you know if my husband's not sick or something? And that's why he's very large. Mm. And someday you may be that heavy. How do you know? They looked at me. And I walked away. And I never said another word. Mm. But people are judgmental, not only with race. That's and my awesome. point is that people everywhere should start to think about whether or not you're judging that person, whether she has curly hair, or you're from a rich, or you're from, or if you're, um, you have a partner, whatever. Yeah. No, there is um, a lot of discrimination that it happens based on people's size and their abilities. People That's who right. have to walk through life with any kind of disability, the world in America is not set up for them to go walk through life. You're easily. absolutely right. And I had to deal with that because I come from my, um, a broken family. And I had gone into a foster home. And I had to live with that. And I was chubby all my life. And when my parents were living, I was an A student. And after that, mm. my grades just went downhill because I was judged by everybody. Look at her, she has a long dress on. So much that I would even go on a school bus and uh, sneak a thread and needle and sew up my skirt so I could fit into the people. Right. And today I look at that and I say, what a fool you must have looked like. <laughs> but I, ha I just felt that I had to fit in. The need to belong is so great. It's so and primal. It, it's worse today than it was back in the day. It's terrible out We're there. We're just going to take one last question, and then I have a few remarks to wrap up. Yes. Hi. So my name is Jocelyn. I'm a student here. Um, I just have a question for the woman sitting next to Anita. So um, I found myself in situations where um, I'm not necessarily the one that is being um, like attacked or made comments at, but a lot of people that are close to me and close around me have. And I'm someone that's very passionate and sometimes emotional about um, if I see like judgment or inequality, it, it just really brings out a fire in me. So I guess my question for you is, um, since I, I can relate to situations that you've been in, how do you sort of control the anger you must feel and con confront them in a way that's going to teach them how to be better rather than just mm. make them angry and do it more, I guess? Yes. Okay. I don't know that I have the answer to that because um, sometimes I, and I can only relate to this on some small level, get really tired of trying to be the, the teacher in ignorant moments. However, I did go into education as a field, so I feel a certain sense of additional responsibility both as an ally and as an educator. Um, and so I think it depends on the situation, to be honest. In the moment where it was getting, so I used the, the camping experience. In that moment, I did not keep my cool uh, because there was a line to me that was very much crossed. Um, I think what I try to do is weigh the intention in the situation and weigh the words that are being used and the tone in which it's being delivered. Um, if it's somebody who is truly operating from a place of ignorance, like as in not understanding their words, their actions, or having exposure to people different than them. Um, I find it easier to work that angle more than the direct hatred. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes um, it's going to have to be a, a case of, I very much disagree with that position mm. and keep it moving from there because there's only so much you can do when someone has dug in their heels and they're hateful and they are just angry and there's nothing you can say that's gonna change that, unfortunately. I think you just have to go based on your actions and how you conduct yourself and hope that it spreads and take the opportunity to educate the people who are who are open to it, even if they don't entirely know they're open to it. We have one coming. I think going back to what you're saying, like these are not things that you could just like tell people. Like 
oh, you're not going to tell them off. People have been like, they've had these beliefs and they're within them. And we all do, I believe that. We all have like pre-existing uh, beliefs for their whole lives. And you're not just going to like have like an argument with them and it's like, oh my God, you just like fixed me, you know? Like, so. <laughs> but um, I, I, think, I think that's why like discussions like these, like coming to these and like actively working on them, like, yeah, like you're like whoever, like when you're in school or throughout your life, it's like a lifelong process and it takes a lot of work. And mm. I think that patience is very important and just like, uh, and, the, and you're working on yourself of being accepting of them. You can't expect other people to be accepting of you if you're not accepting of them. Mm. So it's, it, it's a process. Like it's, I wanted to wrap up because I also want to give you guys a chance to come talk to me privately or anybody on the panel that I hope this discussion gave us a chance to think about the impact of the biases that we all carry in our heads. And even if we got rid of all personal bias, even if we got rid of all hate in this country, we would still live in an unequal society. Why? Because a lot of the systems and institutions in this country, from housing to schools to employment, they were originally set up to favor the majority at the time. And then many of those built-in structural biases remain in place that continue to perpetuate those same inequalities. And correcting that will take policy changes. But I still believe also in the power of small personal interactions to help change society. I'll never forget the response the responses I got to one of the very first columns I ever wrote in my career. It ran a few days after 9-11 in the paper. I had never written a column before. I had been a news reporter. And I wrote about how scary it was to have cousins who worked in those buildings that were attacked. And I wrote about how great the fear was among Muslims of whether our fellow Americans would stand up for us. I got hundreds of email responses. The vast majority of them were very supportive. And I've never forgotten an email that I got from a US Marine who sent me a note after he read that column and said that it would be his honor to stand up and defend my family as fellow Americans. And he's the regular American that I aspire to be. So thank you guys. Thank you to my wonderful panel for everything and sharing so much. Let me give you guys all a hug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh,